Where are we? What is the nature of existence? Konnichiwa, chicken-san. It doesn't seem right. I thought that's what we do. We just we come into other people's countries and overstep international boundaries. Feels weird to me. That seems like a nice thing to do. Nope. I need a rap battle arbitration suits. We will help you. Are you a Google process? We're trying to find interesting musicians to collaborate with all over the world. We are the people in the spirit of music. Oh, 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 oh. Robots are trying to kill us. I'm a dead world. You guys sound great. Really? Welcome, welcome. One more time, guys, the Gregory Brothers. Let's go, come on. Thank That's you. fantastic. You're too kind. Thanks. So excited to have you guys here. Congratulations on the show, all the success, but also uh, congratulations are in order. Evan, I just found out, uh, in addition to your gorgeous two-year-old child, you just had twins. Is this correct? It's true. Yeah, I, you you're found a plug out for twins, people. That's I was what trying you do. to keep That's... it secret, and you found out. I've just recently become a dad to twins. Uh bringing the total number of people under two in the house to three. That's great. Which is a lot. That's a high number. That's big. For those of you keeping score. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, thanks. It's, it's been very hectic in the best possible way. Well, I got to tell you, it's a, it, uh, we sincerely appreciate you being here and making the time. That is fantastic, and, and we're also happy for you. Uh, you teaching everyone to sing? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So it's a family band. It sounds amazing. The newborns, uh, voice is incredible. Right. So much projection from those two. Well, a lot of talent from their parents. Yeah. I, well, you know, I, I, uh, you start simple with, say, you know, Mary had a little lamb, twinkle, twinkle, something like that. Right, right. So basics. far, it sounds a little bit like, ah! <laughs> so there's a ways to go, but you can tell that there's a start there as well. That's a base. That's a base. That's, That's a where start. you begin. It's a starting point. Well, uh, again, congratulations on that. But let's talk about the, the show, Song Voyage. Uh, like I said, I got a chance to watch a couple episodes. And I, in my position here, have to watch... Uh, well, I get to watch a lot of web content, and this show, by far, if not my favorite, one of my favorites. Uh, where did the idea come from for this sort of Anthony Bourdain meets Lonely Island masterpiece that you guys have put <laughs> together? Like, how did this start? Oh, well, thanks, man. First of all, that's very flattering you would say that. I mean, I take that as a sincere compliment. We're very happy with how it came out. I mean, as far as where the idea came from, um, I mean, we've been making music online for a, a, a long time, and almost everything that we have our fingerprints on, on YouTube or elsewhere, has some kind of musical component to it. And really, the germ of the show came from us meeting this company, uh, Portal A, who is behind some very big uh, videos online, like the YouTube Rewind series that you guys may have seen. So they do big, splashy videos. We met them and talked about, let's do something together. And so what came out of that was their desire to do splashy travel and our desire to do comedy and music. So then what you have is this hybrid of a reality travel show that has very unreality elements in it. For sure. I think one of the things that I enjoy most about it is there's, there's an authenticity and a real. You're in these places, you're visiting these countries, but there is this sort of heightened reality of this narrative that you guys kind of construct and weave throughout. Uh, how did you go about choosing the places? Were, was there a large list and you, you kind of picked a, what made the most sense geographically? Uh, how, how did the whole thing kind of come together? Here? Really, I think the first step was looking at the State Department's list of uh, countries with malaria because we were traveling with a seven-month-old child, so that ended up being a pretty major consideration. <laughs> big, yeah. There were some like awesome musicians we wanted to collaborate with in like South India mm -hmm. or like uh, Central Africa that we were like, you know what? After looking at the CDC guidelines, we just can't do it with a seven-month-old child because <laughs> uh, Rose was just like getting vaccination after vaccination. Oh, man. Um, but we, uh, one thing that did help, we wanted to be in places where we were really um, the fish out of water. In every episode, we really wanted to be the ones looking like morons. And so we wanted to be in cultures and countries we'd never been to before. We'd never been in any of these countries where we would have been a little bit more comfortable traveling in South America or Europe that we've right, traveled right. to before. Um, but we also, um, one nice bonus of being almost all in Asia and Australia is we kind of only had one week where we were majorly jet lagged because all those countries kind of lined yeah. up in the same time zone. So you kind of did one huge, awful travel 
and then you were just in a time zone for the rest of the six weeks. There, there were two drivers for picking the countries. One, getting a variety of places to, to go to, places that don't seem the same. But two, who is the like amazing musician that hasn't been found yet, or at least hasn't been noticed by our mostly American audience, that we can dig up, go visit, collaborate with, and make something totally weird with? One of the really fun episodes to do was the, was the uh, Japanese episode, and I don't know if you guys saw any pre-roll from that, but we worked with a guy who's from Japan but has actually lived in Germany for like 40 or 50 years, and basically because of scheduling, et cetera, at the last minute we were like, well, we're not going to be able to go to Germany. We're going to have to find another country. And then we were like, why don't we just fly him to Japan? So for him it was kind of like a homecoming show. He hadn't been home to Japan in like 20 oh, or 30 no years, and he was like visiting his parents who were like 95 and 96, and like coming and teaching us how to yodel. Well, we should say that's, the whole, that's the whole reason that he's not living in Japan is because his dream as a grown Japanese man was to be a professional German yodeler. And he succeeded. He was that good at yodeling. But there's uh, a, a little bit you're missing. A chicken yodeler is what he's known for now, correct? This is his new thing that he's trying to make known globally, and you guys are helping him to spread that message. Did you come to him as the chicken yodeler? Or was that, was that just like icing on the cake once you found him? Yeah, as an aside, let me say that I, I realize that chicken yodeling is, is not a known verb. And there may be some questions in your mind. What is chicken yodeling? We reviewed before you came out here. Are I think okay. everybody here is pretty cool. No, actually, please go on. Elaborate on chicken yodeling. <laughs> well, I would, say, I would say please jump in, Andrew, because <laughs> it's, such a, it's a subtle art, really. But it's... It's yodeling wherein uh, you imitate the sounds of a chicken and possibly fraternize with chickens in, in the videos. Befriend, Whatever gets you there. Befriend them. Um, You're yodeling about chickens in the language of chickens. Yeah, that's correct. So Takeo, our collaborator, had a huge viral hit in which he did some highly memorable chicken yodeling. And so our role when we collaborated with him was how can we revisit this success? How can we build upon this? And it just got stranger from there. Yeah, it's uh, probably, it, that, going back to what you said earlier, that you wanted a wide variety of places, is you hit the nail on the head because there's, there's nothing that overlaps. It's so different from one episode to the next, especially the chicken yodeling one is fantastic. Uh, his song, too, in particular, uh, is, is a good one. We were listening to it earlier before you guys came out. How do you decide when you're, when you're making the music to put the, the artist you're collaborating with front and center? Because for some tracks like that one, he is the song. And then for other ones, uh, the artists are kind of featured there and with you, and you guys take a, a bigger role vocally. How, how do you know to find that balance, and how do you work that out? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and it was totally a case-by-case -case basis where we tried to come to the table with some ideas already so that you weren't in the very awkward position of like being in a room for the first time with somebody and, and going like, so what do you want to do? <laughs> so we got five days to write a song. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we tried to show up with like some things to some things to contribute, and with Takeo, he already had this like viral thing that had happened to him. Like let's let's build on that. Let's not pretend that that hasn't happened, right? So so the thing that we wrote together is kind of like a sequel to that, and we wanted to um, just showcase and make him the centerpiece. But and also Takeo is not kidding himself that chicken yodeling is hilarious. Right. So he's he's in on it. He knows what he's doing. He understands the entertainment value. Of it. I would yeah. say he didn't know what he was doing originally, but now he knows what it is. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to deny <laughs> the, the pure joy that comes with being the professional chicken yodeler. Yeah. But there, but there were other cases where we um, basically couldn't get our collaborator as on board with an idea, or couldn't get the, mm -hmm. the time from them to uh, to feature them as much, or. Our idea was a totally different comedic take. So, so there's two or three episodes where it's more our song than theirs, and, that and that's Worm? fine. It's yeah. kind of different episode by episode. Is that, is that kind of what Death Worm was born out of? Uh. Yes, also because, <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's a song in the episode where we visit Mongolia, probably our most exotic country. Uh, round of applause if you've ever been to Mongolia. <clears throat> but Mongolia in the house? Okay, one. All right. I saw that's more, than, that's that's more than we expected. One, than most, hand, right? one hand more than, more than I expected, expected to see. <laughs> um, so uh, Mongolia is famous for a particular type of singing, usually called throat singing, where you sing these incredibly guttural noises and try to create overtones and, and effectively sing two notes at once. It's, it's kind of mi mystical and otherworldly, but you don't sing a lot of lyrics that way. You mostly go, ooh. And, uh, 
and, th and that's and that sort of thing. So to <laughs> so to write a song with uh, this gentleman named Hosu, it honestly was outside of our area of expertise. Like <laughs> like yeah. we didn't, we're like we're coming from a very uh, Western like uh, pop music, rock music, hip hop idiom. Like how do we write a song that's hopefully going to be very catchy in the throat singing idiom? We don't know how to do that. Um, so in that episode, it ended up that Hosu was more of a he acts a lot in that episode, yeah. and he's more of like our guide in Mongolia, and then a, a foil to the Mongolian deathworm who shows up to sing the song. But then when it, when it came to writing the song, we sort of composed for him like he was an instrument, like he was a lead guitar or something like that. And then we sang lyrics about this mythical worm that haunts Mongolia. We'll get into that later. <laughs> and, and we will. Uh, how, how long were you guys in approximately each location? How much time did you have from spot to spot? We were shooting in each location for like five or six days. Wow. And then, you know, would have a day or two between each location to like travel and rest. Yeah, that's intense. When you guys are in those spots, I imagine a very tight timeline. Every second of every day is accounted for. Did you ever have a chance to just kind of explore? Or it's like, no, we've got to make these shots. We've got to do these things. We have to write this song. Like, how you try to be as prepared, I guess, as you can going into it. But uh, what were what were those trips like? Did you get to actually enjoy and, and experience all of this stuff, or were you just like in work mode? It was really, really busy, and I would say mostly in work mode. I think by the time we got to the last two countries, the production was running smoothly enough that it was sort of like you could get to the point where, like in Japan, because we're really only running one camera. It's like okay for the next four hours. Sarah and Michael are shooting this weird thing where they go to a penguin aquarium. Like, yeah. I don't need to be there. I'll go take myself out to lunch, that sort of thing. Um, but it was, it was pretty rare you'd have a whole, whole day off unless the whole production had a day off. We scheduled one day off for, per country, and a lot of times those would fall off the schedule because we needed to shoot yeah, stuff. Now, I will say that like, it's mostly work time. It was, it was quite busy, but calling it work time on this type of production right. you know, maybe mischaracterizes what exactly it is because if you're on the Mongolian steppe in the middle, like on top of this mountain, and you look and you can see 20 miles and there's not a single other human being in sight, you can't really call that work. It's worse ways to collect a check. Like, there's, like, that's not work at all. Uh, and it's really funny. Uh, I was thinking as I'm watching this, like, this is not only a brilliant show, uh, but it's a brilliant ploy to get someone to pay for an awesome road trip with your family and friends. <laughs> like, shh, shh. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I letting the cat out of the bag? Is that like an industry <laughs> secret? <Did> I <laughs> Although I will say we had a really great crew on this shoot, a really great director, a really great uh, DP, and I think that's part of the reason we were able to get all those great people. Yeah. It's just all the people looked at the itinerary and were sort of like, I want to go to those six yeah. countries. I want to travel the world. Uh, was it hard? Did you guys find yourselves, um, even with the limited time, like accruing a ton of footage and, and having to like make hard decisions about what stays in and what gets cut out? Or, or were you like keeping it really lean and just getting like the things you need? Oh man, we we thought we were keeping it lean, but there's tons of stuff that we shot that that didn't make it into the show, because, um, like I said, you come to a country with some ideas about like, okay, I've heard there are these amazing things here. Let's go try to shoot those, but you've never been there before and things just unfold naturally so we did explore and and do things spontaneously that were unplanned so then afterwards when you try to cut it together to reflect what the experience was not everything can make it in well i mean what are some and, examples and that's like everything from small stuff in terms of like hosu in mongolia being like hey i want to show you how to like char a sheep's head and eat it um <laughs> which we weren't expecting to do to like when we went to the philippines um we ended up totally rewriting the song, and that ended up totally um, making the the whole episode get re-edited in a way and shot in a way we didn't really imagine. I want to I want to go back to that charred head for a second because I really wanted to talk about the food. I mean, that's a huge part of the culture and all these different places. And you guys definitely encounter and eat and experience some interesting things. So I know about the the charred head. That was a surprise for you guys in that moment. Also. Uh, based on the video, was that cooked all the way through? It looked like you were seriously just burning the outside of the head with a metal rod. That, like, what, what did you guys end up actually eating in that point? The, burning the face with a metal rod, I think, if I remember correctly, is just to de-hair the head. Got it. There you're getting the hair off, and then you're boiling the head. But uh, if you boiled the head with the hair still on, you'd have very hairy soup. Naturally, which, which is not a delicacy anywhere. Yeah, that's in the first episode of Julia Child's web vlog. Yeah. Do not boil the head with hair on it. Always remove the hair prior to boiling. Really, I'm just disappointed at all the stuff we ate that didn't make it in the show. Because really, all the grossest stuff we ate somehow didn't make it in the show. And it's like, why did I, why did I have to, 
Yeah, why did I have to eat those like fried Filipino uh, grubs? <laughs> oh, yeah. God. What was that? Uh, the one, uh, it's the heart of, you like take it like an oyster almost. I want to say an eel or a snake that you. It was the heart of a cobra. The heart. Yes. That is the most metal thing I've ever heard in my entire life. You Thanks. ate the heart of a cobra. It's almost, it's almost hard to even say it out loud, knowing that I, knowing that I did it. Yeah. And Can you it's walk? been some time now since we shot it, and no, no baby cobras have come out of me, and I, I haven't turned into a cobra yet, so there seemed to be no lasting effects. But it, it, was, it was a moment that I look back on as maybe a turning point in my life. Do you feel more murderous than you used to? Thank you. That, yeah. You, oh, absolutely. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Specifically venomous? Is there a... Is there a yeah. Yeah? I, mean, I haven't killed anybody, but I think about it all the time. Right now. Well... That's why we put that three-foot barrier between the front row and the stage in case one of our guests flies off the handle and decides this is the moment I'm going to exercise my it, cobra it, heart. It, that it turns out the yeah. death penalty is actually a really strong deterrent in America, guys. No. So. <laughs> um, well, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about the show because it's, it's so incredible, but I also would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, the plethora of, of music that you guys have provided us over the years and all that stuff. How long now have you guys been making music together? Like, how long has you been, have you been doing this? We've been, we've been making music together probably for around 10 years now, but we were remarking to each other over the election cycle. We were songifying all the debates, mm -hmm. and we were realizing that was kind of the eighth anniversary of us making YouTube videos together because it was during the Obama-McCain debates that we first started making some of these videos together. Yeah, so, I mean, some of you may know that our, our main thing is making kind of remixed music videos out of found footage, especially like political and new stuff, but also viral videos, and that's kind of how we got uh, big, and it really started during the election eight years ago. Before that, we were a totally conventional band playing original music and touring around like bands do, yeah. and then once we kind of like hit this formula on YouTube of something that was unique to us and that people wanted to watch, we just started putting more and more of our eggs in that basket. Mm -hmm. And um, now it's like we are YouTubers where music is our main thing as opposed to a band that also posts videos. Right, and that's about the time that you started infusing all the humor into it too, right? Like and making it funny and, and entertaining and sort of found yourselves as now sort of these comedians, not just these musicians. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, it's odd because our brand of humor is all based in music videos and, and sketch. It's not stand-up or conventional kind of TV sketch or, or whatever. So we are, have become considered part of the comedy scene, but it's hard to kind of categorize us. So other comedians in New York don't necessarily know what to do with us or, or, or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's why we didn't get invited to their birthday party, I guess. That's... Well, I, I wasn't going to say anything. That's actually what they told me right before we came out here. They said, don't bring that up. It's a sore spot. I said, no, they can take it. So there's kind of like a joke, though, in the entertainment industry that, like, most musicians, like, really just want to be comedians, and most comedians really just wish they were musicians. Yeah. So I do feel like we're, we're kind of getting to have our cake and eat it, too. Yeah. You know? well, we're also kind of navigating both of them. You're also, you're also navigating that weird uh, uh, minefield. I've, I've talked about this with a couple of other uh, sort of web creators that, like, you know, years and years ago, uh, people in the film industry were like, oh, I don't do television, I do film. And that's where, you know, you didn't cross those two barriers. And now it's sort of like TV and film people are like, well, you know, that web content's different from what we're doing over here. But ultimately, we all come to find that, no, we're just all creative people entertaining one another. So you've got, like, a lot of different hurdles to climb. But you guys uh, seem to transcend all that. You, you worked on the theme song for, uh, for Kimmy Schmidt, is that right? How, yeah, yeah, how did that kind of come together and work out? That's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, it was great. I mean, the, that show is just so funny and well put together. Yeah. And the theme song just got a lot of love from the audience. So, so we felt like a lot of the glow from the show bled over onto us. But really, we mostly feel lucky just to be involved. The, the show was already conceived and had this idea that a viral video would kind of kick off mm -hmm. the show um, when the creators came up with it. The creators are Tina Fey. Her husband Jeff Richmond. Never and, heard of her. And and Robert. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're they're comedians. I'll tell you about it later. But yeah, you fill me in later. Um, so they I'll already had the idea for what the theme song would be, and it was this viral video concept. And it was it was basically stuff we're known for doing. So they filmed the whole, whole show, and when it was getting packaged and getting ready to go to to Netflix, 
their like the last thing that gets put together is the opening titles and the theme song and stuff. And at that point, they were kind of like, yeah, this is like six weeks before the show comes out. <laughs> yeah, and oh, they were man. like, what if, what if that thing that we planned a year ago that's sort of like a Gregory Brothers thing, what if we just got the Gregory Brothers to do it? <laughs> and of course, so they called us, and of course we immediately said yes. And so yeah. we were really just working on it in that run up to the release of the show and taking the song that had sort of already been written by Jeff Richmond, the show composer, and just executing it so that it sounded yeah. really good, sounded like the same way we would compose something like that, and it and it came off like a real viral video. And then we cut the opening titles to match. One of my favorite things about that video is like a really, if you're a big fan of Kim, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, is like kind of an Easter egg. They wanted us to do something in the version we posted on YouTube where that we've done in some other, uh, of our other videos where you have like people dancing and people playing instruments as you get deeper into the video. And we wanted to use a clip from a Broadway show, but we couldn't get any of it cleared. Oh. And finally, the people at Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt were like, wait, there's one Broadway show that is cleared for us, and that's Daddy's Boy, <laughs> which is the Broadway show in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Yeah. So if you watch really closely, like there's shots of like these people dancing, and you're like, huh, like this doesn't look like actual archival footage. It's because it's Daddy's Boy. It's from the show. Yeah. That's fantastic. No, my initial reaction upon seeing it was like, oh, these guys would do a really incredible Gregory Brothers impression. Like, with, and then I found out you guys actually did it. I was like, of course, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so it was, it was really cool. Uh, I just wanted to figure that out. Um, we're going to turn it over to audience Q and A in just a second. Uh, just one more question about this show because I was really curious about this. I, I've seen, like I said, I love sort of that genre of travel shows and all the different places, and I think you guys are definitely doing a, a unique take on it, and it's a, a refreshing spin. Uh, but the Mongolian trip, I've actually seen maybe like one or two other trips that have gone to sort of that same area. I've gone through similar motions and have done the wrestling thing, mm -hmm. and so I was wondering if there was ever this vibe from the locals of like, oh man, yet another like bunch of clumsy white dudes to put on our costumes and be mystified by our ways, or were they like, did they love it? Did they like they 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 look forward to these moments to like show other people how they do their like their thing? Just in terms of wrestling, like I just can't, I, I couldn't believe how obsessed that country is with wrestling because while we were there the world championships of wrestling was happening right. in Los Angeles, and it was like everyone was talking about it. Like, everyone was like, did you, like, listen to this match? Like, your, our cab drivers were, like, listening to it on the radio. It was, like, being broadcast. The way we would be watching the Super Bowl or Brits would be watching the World Cup or whatever, they were watching the wrestling championships across the world. Yeah, so I, I really, I didn't get that vibe from them. I got from them uh, an extreme pride about their yeah. culture. They were super proud, especially of like their nomadic like horse culture and their um, th like the wrestling side of their culture. I don't think they had, they weren't fooling themselves that like now it's turned into part tourism industry, but that didn't take away from their pride at it. For sure. Well, it, like I said, I can't sing praise enough. I really enjoyed the show. I know the soundtrack's available now, right, as well. I saw yeah, that. It's out on iTunes. It's out on iTunes, uh, so you can listen to that. And uh, the first episode just premiered this past Wednesday. Uh, are they going to release every Wednesday? Is that the plan? I think it's every other Wednesday. Well, you can watch the whole show already if you're a subscriber to Sling, like the, the, the TV feed app. Um, but individual episodes are going to come out every other Wednesday on YouTube. Awesome. Well, congratulations, guys. Let's go ahead and turn it over, uh, take some questions from the audience. I see first one over here on the left. Hey, guys. Thank you for being here. Uh, what's the most challenging part about doing the Happy Sad Song series? <laughs> oh, man, great question. Thanks for asking that. So we, uh, so we do a series called Happy Sad Songs where we take uh, <clears throat> songs from the radio, top 40, or maybe some classic tunes, and we change the key from a major key to a minor key or vice versa and thereby the emotion of the song from happy to sad, or the other way around. And some strange results can occur. Now, what's the hardest part of, of um, doing a happy sad song? I, I would say sometimes when you do something as, it's sort of like musical mathematics to change something from a major key to a minor key. And sometimes the result has a really natural s sound, but sometimes it sounds really angular and odd. Like this is a melody that no one would have ever chosen. And this obviously came from some weird process, which is true. So the, I'd say the hardest thing is singing those and making it seem natural as if you're a singer singing something, uh, some, some really natural melody and doing it on purpose. Also after seeing them over and over again while we're tracking, it's very difficult to then later hear that same song like in your local bodega or local bagel store and then not get your 
major or minor cover of it stuck in your head for the rest of the day? It's a very specific, but I can imagine, excruciating problem. Not that that has happened to me. (laughs) Just for example, we did a version of Uptown Funk where it... it, um, it's as if it was sung by some very sad Benedictine monks. You probably imagine, you, you can probably imagine what that sounds like. So then if you're in CVS and Uptown Funk uh, comes on, it's weird to then be walking out of the CVS with the other version in your head and you're going, this hit, that ice cold, Michelle Pfeiffer, that white gold. It just makes it, Puts your day on a different pace. Yeah, do you guys find yourself constantly being bummed out by all the happy pop songs that you've Like, you hear them everywhere you go. That's like the nature of the, that's why the video works. You pick songs that everybody's familiar with. So you're constantly reminded of the sad versions of the songs you wrote. Yeah, totally. So you just it's carry a, that around all day? Oh, it's a horrible existence. Oh my God. I feel terrible for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's change the topic entirely. Let's go, let's move past this. Next question. Somebody else. Hey, what's up, players? It's great to have you here. You guys are the YouTube OGs. Um, truly. I grew up watching Auditune in the News and uh, I uh, absolutely just loved it. So I think we need to mention the Bed Intruder song. I know that took you to the next level, Hide Your Kids Indeed. So before putting that out there, what were you guys feeling that the reaction would be from the public? Because that really solidified you, I think, as next level, big deal, we're here, we're on the internet, we're taking over. Uh, Did you go into that thinking that that would be the video that would kind of solidify your status? I, th- I think at the time, we really felt like our video was just one part of this really big moment that Antoine was having. I remember at the time, YouTube had like a charts page where you could look at like the most, the 50 most watched videos over the previous two days and scrolling over to it and all 50 of those videos, this is before we posted our video, were different rips of the Antoine Dodson original interview. Like the 50 most viewed videos were all that different versions of that video. So it's like that was a really big moment for Antoine. And our video, like over the course of years, ended up kind of being what people remember most, maybe just because it was a catchy song. But at at the moment, I don't think I realized how big it was going to be. Yeah, there was no way we could anticipate that our thing, which we thought would just be a drop in the bucket, would become the biggest part of this phenomenon. Now, we we realized with maybe within 48 hours. And so we were able to get in touch with uh, Antoine and basically went into business together where we could sort of sell the song together and be partners as opposed to just two people that never met and had sort of like been a part of this same remix. So we're still in touch and uh, we split shares of sales of the song, so on and so, on and so forth. But um, cool. yeah, there's no way to anticipate a like viral hit in, in that way. Yeah, you can't, you don't go into it thinking that, right? You have to approach every song as its own thing. I know, and, yeah. I know people have calculations about, about how to do that, but there's, no matter how much you can angle for success online, some component of it is still a, ro- a roll of the dice. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So. Hey, guys. Uh, so I saw that you uh, guys were performed last night at the Brooklyn Yule Ball, and, uh, you st- which I didn't get to go to, but uh, you have another show coming up. I was wondering what songs you are on your set list, and are they uh, holiday related at all? Um, are you a plant? That's an amazing question. Just setting up our sh- our show. I love it. Yes, we did perform last night at the Bell House uh, at a gig called the Yule Ball, which is a holiday uh, show. But we host our own holiday show in New York, and we've been doing it ten years in a row. And so the show predates our YouTube identity, and it's completely separate from everything we do online. It's incredibly cozy and holiday-oriented. We outlaw any non-Christmas songs at the show. <laughs> yeah, there were, like, eight, nine years ago, there were people that would try to sneak in and play their normal sets. We We'd have, we have guests show. open for us, right? And they try to do their own original stuff. We, we booted them. Get that out of here. Nope. Yeah. If you're, if you're not doing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, you're out the door. Yes, yeah, so it's all Christmas music. It's this Sunday at the Rockwood Music Hall. Yeah, sun, Sunday night. I mean, if you guys want to get super Christmassy, you should come. So it's this Sunday night, yeah. uh, and with tickets or how, how does it work? Are they still? I think uh, it's going to s- it'll, website it'll probably sell out, but it's, it'll probably sell out today. So if you got if you get tickets now, I th- but I think they're still yeah, available still right now. Yeah, yeah, it's at the Rockwood Music Hall, stage two, Sunday night. 
Awesome. And then the the show Song Voyage. If you're uh, on, uh, you said on Sling, you can see all of it right now. Uh, otherwise, every other Wednesday, check out the channel. It's going to be coming out right. And the music's on iTunes. We got everything. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it, guys. Uh, again, thank you so so much, guys. One more time, make some noise for Evan thank and Andrew you. here, the Gregory brothers. It's great to be here. Thank Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.